Good evening, friends. We are here for a special meeting to give participants of our August uh, month of action some information on talking points for your visits, as well as how to have a successful visit with your legislators. So tonight we are going to be primarily talking about two things. We're going to be going over the uh, talking points and the resources that we have prepared for you for your visits. And then Josh Houston will be giving you some Advocacy 101, primarily the Ten Commandments. So right now we don't have anybody else on the video, so we're just going to go forward and have this be a recording so that you all can watch it in the days to come as you prepare for your visits. So first up, we're going to have B. Moorhead going over the resources that we have prepared for you, and I'm going to be switching over to screen sharing so that you can see that as a part of this recording. So in order to see these resources, if you go to our website, it is going to be the very first thing, uh, texasimpact.org. It's this very first link here, August Action for Migration Justice Resources. You're going to click the Read More. And then you'll be on this nice, lovely little article. There are two links here. There are the Migrant Justice Worship Resources. We would like you to use those resources in your worship services uh, starting this week and for the rest of the month. Uh, we have talked about these worship resources in Weekly Witness. That was this past Monday, so if you would like to hear more about those, please go listen to that podcast. But for tonight, we're going to be talking about this link, the AWOA Talking Points. So click on that, and it'll pull up a PDF. And there are three primary documents in here, and I will turn it over to B for her to share that with you. So, hey, thanks, Erica. So the first document is what we would describe as our leave behind for district visits on migration justice. Uh, these are the most distilled talking points we have. They are the three asks that we have for members of Congress during the August recess to uh, stabilize the southern border and stop the immediate crisis. Um, they certainly won't replace comprehensive immigration reform, but they would be a good start. The first one is to stop criminalizing migration. And under that are several um, sub recommendations. The first one is to end the Remain in Mexico or MPP Migrant Protection Program um, and the port metering where people can't get across to claim asylum uh, because the, uh, the Border Patrol say that the they're full up that day. So ending all of those, um, the, the uh, limitations on people crossing into the United States to claim asylum is the first thing. Second, funding the civil immigration system to process migrants timely. Investing in upgrades to the ports of entry and investing in staff for ports of entry to maintain efficient processes um, all of those things all would contribute to ending the criminalization of migration and restoring a, a rational approach to the, uh, the way we manage the border. The second major topic, so that was topic number one of the three. The second major topic is stop the separation of families and detention of children. So there's two primary things here. The first one is we... We know that there are currently proposals, legislative proposals, that would undo the um, protections that currently exist for children in the, the legal decision that's known as the Flores Settlement. Um, what we want to make sure that we're clear with Congress about is that we don't, it's not necessary to oppose the entire piece of legislation known as the Humane Act or the entire uh, legislative framework for border security and asylum. It's necessary, though, to make sure that no proposal undoes current protections for families and children. So while we appreciate the 
all the work that members of Congress want to do to keep Americans safe and maintain safe borders and all of those things. We don't want to see any protections rolled back that currently exist for children. The second, is, under this major topic, is um, funding local government agencies and nonprofits to provide the humanitarian assistance and legal assistance that migrants need to, to avoid needing to be detained. So right now, detention is partly a function of lack of capacity to move people quickly through the system and into communities where they're receiving families and uh, uh, American associates are. So providing the adequate funding for local government and nonprofits to help people move through the process quickly also would reduce the, the perceived demand for detention. The third issue, so the first one is criminalization of migration, stopping that. The second is stopping separation of families and detention of children. The third is to make everything about the asylum process transparent. And primarily what that means is welcoming and requesting civil and human rights observers into detention facilities and to all of the other parts of the asylum process. If what's happening on the border were happening in another country, perhaps as a result of a natural disaster or a violent conflict, the United States would expect that the United Nations would send observers in, that we would be able to help monitor to make sure that human and civil rights are uh, respected and enforced. This is no different than if it were happening in another country. It's just that because we perceive ourselves to be champions of human rights, it's surprising to us to think that we should need to be monitored. But the same, the same things happen under any conditions of crisis, that there's a lot of people, there's a lot of stuff going on. We should expect and hope that we would get the same monitoring and objective third party evaluation as any other country would that's dealing with this, this kind of crisis. So those are the three topics. Um, it's probably unlikely that you would be able to cover all three of them in huge detail in a, con a congressional district visit, but hopefully you can go over all three of them at least a little bit and leave this paper, which is informed by the much longer conclusions of the Interfaith Immigration Coalition. So the Interfaith Immigration Coalition is a partnership of a lot of denominational and other national uh, religious organizations that have together put together policy recommendations for Congress. Some of them are budget related, some of them are not. Some of them have to do with international policy. For our part in Texas, we are focusing on um, the, the, the domestic policy issues, particularly relating to the budget, that Congress could address immediately. And I think that's important to stress in these meetings, that th we're not saying that this is all that needs to happen, but we're saying Congress has a responsibility to start the ball rolling on changing the current state of affairs. And the three things that we've mentioned are three things that would do that in the short run. This uh, document from the Interfaith Immigration Coalition includes a lot of information about um, other policies that are also important, that include international policy, that would take longer to implement in some cases, and some resources at the end um, for further reading. So we would recommend that you study those things before you have your visit, and also feel free to leave those with the, the office because they are, uh, they are recommendations that we, the Texas Impact affirms and they represent the consensus positions of our national denominational partners. The third document in this packet is, oh, this is still part of the same, um, this is about ways to uh, budget for just migration policy. The last document is from the National Immigration Forum. This is not a faith-based organization, it's a, a think tank. And this is um, a, just a deep dive into 
the humane act, the humanitarian upgrades to manage and assist our nation's enforcement. Um, this is a piece, a bipartisan piece of legislation by two Texans, Senator John Cornyn and Representative Henry Cuellar. And um, the National Immigration Forum has gone through it and uh, analyzed in quite a bit of detail what the implications would be for different populations and programs. Um, and I think for Texas Impacts part, we would particularly point your attention to changes to protections for unaccompanied mig migrant children, treatment of changes to treatment of migrant children in family units, um, limits the release of unaccompanied children to sponsors. Um, so it, it would make substantive changes to the way that the protections that children currently are afforded. Also, it would make changes to the asylum process and some other uh, changes that, that we would weigh in uh, probably less, um, including some provisions having to do with um, relationship with other countries. So those are the three documents that you have, the one-pager, the longer document from the Interfaith Immigration Coalition, and the document from the uh, National Immigration Forum. Those should help you systematize your thoughts. Obviously, if you have personal stories you want to tell, if you've been to the border, or if you want to tell stories about interactions you've had with migrant people in your local community, you should give priority to the particularity of your own experience. That's what members of Congress hope their constituents can share with them. It's not like they can't get policy recommendations from other places too. It is, however, very helpful to affirm that you are a person of faith, that you understand that your national denomination or faith tradition is taking positions on the issue and that you can affirm that this set of recommendations is, uh, is a consensus position of a lot of different faith traditions and also is supported by faith communities in your own state, Texas. So does that, Erica, do you feel like that covers the resources pretty thoroughly? I think maybe could you talk a little bit about why the uh, legislative branch of the federal government is particularly good, going to be useful in establishing these three things to stabilize the southern border? So the, that's, a, that's a good question. And it really is important to remember that in the current crisis, the administration is getting a lot of the attention. There's a lot of attention to administration policies. But the, the fact is, in this country, Congress makes the laws. They, Congress gets to set our policies for how we're going to treat asylum seekers, how what we're going to fund, the priority that we're going to give to different programs, and it's it's uh, it's not fair to Congress or to the administration to place all of the responsibility for immigration, asylum, border security uh, at the feet of the administration and assume that there's nothing Congress can do or assume that we have to wait for an election for Congress to take action because they can only take action if they get certain kinds of mandates from elections. Congress is elected to do a really tough job. One of the ways that they can get information that they need to do it is to talk with people in the district about their positions. They're supposed to represent the positions of their constituents. So if people don't go talk to members of Congress, don't share not just their sort of touchy-feely concerns that it bothers me when I see these news stories, but really engage in the policy discussion, it's not really fair to expect Congress to be able to legislate the way that they are supposed to. So it's really sort of all of our responsibility together to be having this conversation and not just to assume, well, if the president has a particular position, I guess we just have to go with that. Congress gets to call the shots, but if they don't, then that's their and our responsibility. Absolutely. 
All right, thank you so much, B. We're now going to switch over to Josh Houston, and I'm going to turn the screen sharing off as he joins us at the table. And now Josh is going to teach us how to effectively have a visit with our members of Congress and give us some um, Ten Commandments on how those visits should go. Yeah, my name is Joshua Houston, I'm General Counsel with Texas Impact, and uh, yeah, we have developed a thing they call the Ten Commandments of the Legislature. And like most uh, laws and rules, we have developed these because sometimes it's gone wrong. So uh, these are all fun examples of what not to do because somebody has messed it up before. Right off the bat, number one, you'll be doing district visits, so this won't be quite as relevant as it would be if you were at the Texas Capitol or U.S. Capitol, but uh, don't knock. Um, now, it'll be in bank buildings and storefronts, probably, and most of the district offices are like that, so it's a little bit different. But the reason that this is a rule that I want to stress, and why we kept it in there, is that the legislature is the people's branch of government. It's the branch of government that's most accessible uh, to, to the citizenry, it was designed to be that. The, the executive enforces, the judiciary interprets, you need a bar card to get in front of the judiciary usually uh, to really be an advocate, but not the legislative branch. The legislative branch is the one that retains the power uh, and really is the one to, to go to to, to uh, have uh, needs and concerns like this addressed. So don't knock, walk right in, it's your office, it's your district's office, uh, it belongs to you and, and, and you should just go right in and fill it home. That said, uh, two, uh, Thou shalt not fail to introduce thyself. So when you have a legislative visit, one of the most easy things to do is to be thinking about the merits of whatever you're there to talk about. And it is really super easy to just completely forget to say, hi, I'm Joshua Houston. I'm general counsel with Texas Impact. Just the basic human uh, niceties uh, and, and, and uh, that come with being a human being. Tell them who you are, say where you're from, your hometown, any other connection you have with the district, like uh, your faith community, what, what's your job or your employer, anything that can help you establish that relationship with the district that they're there to represent and help them understand it. Three, don't have unrealistic expectations of your visit. So right off the bat, you're probably almost absolutely going to be meeting with staff. Uh, do not be offended by that. Uh, right off the bat, you're there to visit the legislative office. The office is an office. You elect somebody to that office, but that is just one person, and an office is not one person. In this case, an office is, is a team of people. And when you're talking to staff people, remember you're there talking to your elected official's brain. Uh, I don't mean that derogatorily in any way, shape, or form. Uh, they hire staff to be their policy brain because they are more of a they are more of a management uh, where they are having meetings with constituents, they're having meetings with donors, they're having meetings with other legislators, they're having meetings with the staff, they're having meetings with the committee, they're having to respond to different crises in the district. They have paid that person to be the expert on a particular issue, uh, and that is, that is why you want to never, ever do anything to diminish the importance of that person sitting there with you, that, that person sitting there is an extension of that elected official and should be treated just as you would have treated that elected official. That said, uh, another thing is, you may be meeting in a weird location. I, I, every one of these district offices is going to be a little bit different. Even if you're in the Capitol, you're sometimes in a hallway or in a lobby, especially if you have a large group. Don't be offended by that. That is not a, an insult at all. It's usually just logistics. Uh, number four, thou shalt not fail to read the room. I mean, this is just a human thing that's easily forgotten, right? Look around. Is there a high level of stress in the office? Uh, are people really freaking out? Does there appear to be a lot of tension? Uh, was the tweet of the day something that totally caused a problem for them? You, you don't know what it is that, that they, they may or may not be dealing with a crisis in the committee. It could be any number of things. If you notice that stress, uh, just offer to come back in 10 or 15 minutes or whenever is the best time. Just, just be a human being and say, like, look, is it better if I come back in a little bit? I know we had a scheduled meeting, but is it more convenient if I come back at a certain time? You'll make a friend that way because, I mean, if you try to go ahead and have your meeting when someone's obviously preoccupied, they're not going to hear what you have to say, but if you offer to come back and, and, and slightly inconvenient for you, uh, nevertheless, you're going to make a friend and they're going to greatly appreciate that and, and be able to hear uh, a lot more of what you have to say. Five, don't be a jerk, ever. Uh, there's really no exception to this rule. I'm an attorney. I love exceptions to the rules while I have a job. There are no exceptions to this rule about being a jerk. Always be polite. 
there is a huge difference in being principled and being antisocial. Uh, don't argue, agree to disagree. Once you have said your piece, remember they're there to represent that entire district and the other people in the district that have different opinions. Um, agree to disagree, make a really good sound policy argument by the end of the day. Uh, there's going to be something else, I guarantee it, that you agree with that member about. You do not want to ever preclude a future relationship on a future issue by being a jerk. Uh, number six, uh, thou shalt not threaten. What do I mean by this? Uh, I remember when I was on staff for a House member in the state uh, legislature, uh, people, and it would happen more often than you would think, would say, well, we'll remember this come November. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, that's the big elephant in the room for every elected official is they know that there is another election coming up. Like, that's duh. Uh, so if you uh, are asking for a vote on the bill and the answer is no, don't threaten revenge at the ballot box. Everybody knows that the ramifications for voting a certain way. Uh, it makes you look like an amateur. It's super rude and uh, it's just not going to get you anywhere. So why do it? If the answer is yes, thank that legislator. They do not get out of boys or out of girls or a good job, well done hardly ever they get complaints uh, and they get told when they did something bad they rarely get told when they do something good make sure you thank them make sure you support the vote when you get back home in the district in any way you can and and be sure you can ask ask uh, how can you help uh, because if they are on your side they probably need your help uh, and they need your help in some way and be sure to ask uh, number seven thou shall not exceed five minutes uh, now this might be a little bit different because it might, but 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 what I mean by a little bit, I mean ten, maybe fifteen minutes tops. I, I would that's really pushing it. I would say keep it to ten. Uh, but you drove to get there. You drove across town in traffic. They know that was the point. What you're doing is something that is uh, exceptionally rare uh, in American politics or state politics, which is going to visit your legislature. If you think voting is low turnout, showing up at a legislative office is super, super, super low turnout. We're talking fractions of 1% will ever do it. Um, that effort is what is not, I mean, you showing up is 90% of it. Uh, that is a very, a very high level of effort, which shows a high level of concern for a particular issue. And that made the impact of this that you showed up, not the length of your visit. Now, there's a very important exception to this rule. If the staffer is talking, be quiet and listen. Uh, in fact, uh, don't just be quiet and listen, take notes, because they are telling you something and they're telling you something for a reason. They live in a, a, a very um, sensitive, their jobs are very sensitive. I mean, they're, they're landmines all over the place in that particular line of work. It's easy for them to say something wrong and get fired. That is a thing that routinely happens to, to legislative staff. Uh, if they're telling you something, they are telling you something for a reason and it's worth writing it down. Which brings me to number eight. Do not forget to fill out a legislative evaluation. Democracy is a team effort. You are there not as yourself as an individual, you are there as a member of your local church, you're there as a member of your national denomination, you're there uh, as part of a community, not just the district, and, and as a member of the district that you're from. So democracy is a team effort. Uh, and your team needs to know what happens. So in addition to taking good notes, make sure those notes make it into the legislative evaluation form. And in this case, since it's federal, uh, make sure that your national policy office of your denomination gets a copy of it, and make sure that we in Texas get a copy of it too, because we're gonna be working with a national policy office to make sure that everybody knows uh, the information that, that y'all have been are fanning out and going to be, to be receiving. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody knows uh, all that information because it can really be the difference in, in, in how policy gets made. Number nine, don't forget a thank you note. Uh, this is a, obviously a not, it's a lost art. It's a, it's a thing that is not only, uh, it's a very nice thing to do, but, but in addition to, to just courtesy, uh, there's a pragmatic reason for doing this. It's like two visits for the price of one. Uh, in 48 hours, 72 hours, however long the mail takes, when that thank you note arrives, that staffer or person will go, oh yeah, I remember that nice person I had a meeting with, uh, and they will have thought about you uh, 48, 72 hours later, which will help them remember you if you ever go, and hopefully you do, go meet with them again about some other issue in the future. Uh, it's, it's 
yeah, two for the price of one is the way to think about uh, the thank you note. Which brings me to the final commandment, thou shalt not be one in one. Um, if you expect to go have a, le a legislative meeting and that's the end of it, uh, and you want concrete results and you didn't get it, so you're never gonna do that again, um, that's not how this works. Uh, democracy is a way of life. Your most important thing you can be doing is voting. Make sure you're voting in November. Make sure you're voting in March, in the primary of your choosing. Uh, that is where a vast majority of elected officials are elected, is in the March primary in both parties. Uh, and make sure you're making future district visits. No, it, it is never a one and done. It's a relationship that you want to have with whoever's in office. Uh, and then make sure you're joining civic organizations. Uh, this isn't, this doesn't happen for free. Um, and make sure that you are also teaching other folks and encouraging other folks to, to do this with you. Um, democracy is, is about numbers and group efforts. Uh, and it's never about one person. Um, and that will help make you a better uh, and more effective uh, advocate in the future. Uh, and that being said, I think we should thank those that have already donated to us in order to make this week turned into month, turned into potentially more than that uh, of action possible. Uh, thank you for everyone who has donated to our organization and become a member. And we absolutely uh, put your funds to use uh, for activities like this. Yeah, like PBS, this would not happen, but for viewers like you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so Josh, it, just to summarize, I think what you're saying is basically we want our people to go into their elected official offices and have a conversation and, you know, read the room. Uh, sometimes you will have to knock, for example, when V and I went to go visit uh, Senator Cornyn's office, you know, we had to because there it was locked and we couldn't just ah, enter in. The layout, so, yeah, okay. On occasion, um, that does, yeah. yeah. So, I think for those particularly the big offices in big cities, you may have to knock just because otherwise you won't get into your meeting. Mm -hmm. But again, these people are here, you have elected them, they are here for you. Uh, and this is to be a conversation to hopefully change things for the better. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to visit our website at texasimpact.org. Um, you can contact us, call our number 512-472-472. Uh, uh, 3903 and you can reach any of us. Oh, and I see that we just got someone on the line. Hello. Hi. Okay. Well, this is Robin in Houston. If you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, otherwise, you can contact us by phone, like I just said, or you can shoot me an email at Erica, E R I C A, at TexasImpact.org. We would love to hear from you. Uh, we, you did remind me that we need to be getting the legislative eval form up on the website and probably email that to everybody who's going on a visit. Um, otherwise, let us know if you have anything before your visit and we'd love to hear from you and see pictures that you take of your visits and how your visits go. So thank you so much and that'll be us signing off.